All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly Episode 68, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, yeah, we have some holy wars today. We got uh, quite a lot of tiny, like, beat sized awesomeness, but not as many articles and getting started tutorials. But uh, you know what? Let's just jump right in and see what we have here today. As usual, the first section is getting started. And the first article we got here today is the complete guide to React refs. If you are getting started with React and you are not sure what the refs API is and how to use it, this article is for you. In about 10 minutes of reading time, it will cover everything you need to know about refs and how to use them to help you build better apps. Um, refs are immensely useful. So if you, um, if you don't know about them, do check this one out. It is quite good. Next article we got here is building AR ops in React Native powered by GraphQL using Hasura. Now, the interesting part for me at least was the fact that you can actually build AR ops using React Native, which is something I did not know before. So there is actually a special version of React Native that is has bindings to AR Kit and AR Core by Google and Apple. And uh, you can use React Native to build full AR experiences. And this tutorial guides you through uh, building the very basic one. And okay, in this case, they're also using Hasura backend with GraphQL to uh, query the data. But this is, I guess, the least interesting part of the whole tutorial. So if you are interested in building AR ops, and you are, you know, React Native, but you never knew how exactly you could use AR Kit or AR Core. Well, now you know, so uh, just check out this article and have a look at what they are offering. It is actually quite, quite good. All right. Next thing we got here is React Hooks in 20 Minutes, a pretty nice tutorial that introduces you to React Hooks, just as it says in about 20 minutes, actually, I think a bit less than that. So if you're getting started with React or maybe you've been working in, in React, like the older versions pre hooks and you're still not quite into the hooks, but you needed a nice intro and for some reason the React official documentation didn't work for you. Well, this article got you covered. It has everything you need to know about the hooks. All the basic hooks are here and the quite a few examples on how exactly to use them in your code with like while solving the real life problems, let's put it this way. So if you need to get started with hooks in React, do check this one out. Next article we got here is creating a map methods for objects, strings, sets and maps. A pretty basic tutorial that demonstrates how to create your own um, prototype dot map for all of those uh, types of objects. And uh, in this case, they actually um, the authors extend the native prototypes, which is something I would heavily advise against because it just brings confusion basically. But nonetheless, the exercise of writing your own functions is quite good. So if you are uh, just getting started with JavaScript, this is actually a perfect uh, article for you. Hey, Dragon, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got React at 60 FPS, building a medium inspired zoom with React pose. Uh, yes, because <laughs> I'm just, just, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so the Moo tools, uh, why extending prototypes is bad, just to um, extend this discussion. If you didn't know, the Moo tools did that back in the days. And I mean, it still exists. Some people are still using it in legacy code, especially. And the problem is Moo tools extended the object prototypes or, you know, the prototypes of native objects and ended up breaking the web because uh, some of the new features in JavaScript are using the names that they are using right now because they couldn't use the proper names because MooTools extended those and did something completely different with them. And uh, that's kind of messed up the web quite a bit. So please don't do that. Uh, but okay, back to the article. Um, medium like Zoom with React Pose. A pretty nice tutorial that shows you how to use React Pose to do this the uh, zoom that the medium has on the images in your react app, which is actually quite straightforward. So react pose is a very nice um, animating library. So if you uh, never heard about it, or maybe you wanted to do something like this, do check this one out. It's actually a very good tutorial on how to get started with it. It is very simple and very cool. Next article we got here is JavaScript debugging done right, or um, I would actually change the title and say how to debug stuff in JavaScript. 
variety of approaches. So it's basically just an introduction to a different techniques that uh, you can use for debugging, starting with your uh, favorite console.log and my favorite console.log, uh, going into the dev tools, and then going into more advanced uh, approaches like setting up VS Code with debugger for Chrome and attaching directly from your editor. And the same goes for the Node.js. So if you are, what is wrong with my browser? There we go. So if you're just getting started and uh, not quite sure how the debugging works and how you can do it, then this article is for you. Uh, and the next one as well. So the next article we got here is debugging JavaScript like a pro, which uh, basically shows you more advanced techniques of using Chrome DevTools. Uh, not exactly all of them are advanced, but you know, starting from the more uh, interesting approaches like using breakpoints, and then monitoring variables and stuff like this. So if you are again, just getting started with debugging, wasn't sure how the dev tools work, make sure to check this one out. It has quite a lot of useful information here to get you started with uh, dev tools debugging in no time. Right, next thing we got here is boost your legacy apps with Swell 3 components, a pretty nice write up that shows you how to build a uh, basic components, JavaScript component that you can then use in your legacy app, but the component is built in Swell 3, which is actually turns out to be very, very simple. So it's a really neat uh, example. So it's a pick a place component that shows the leaflet map and then allows you to select a place, click a button, use location to use it anywhere. And then the article shows how to integrate, how to build that component first, how to export it as a standalone component, and then how to actually use it in a Bootstrap 3 and jQuery app, which is actually a pretty realistic use case. So if you ever need to do something like this, do check this one out. The next article we got here is understanding worker threads in Node.js. Uh, it's basically all all in one article that covers everything you have to know about worker threads. Uh, are they real threads or why Node.js will never have real threads? What are the solutions? How does the worker threads work and how do you actually use them? So if you are still not sure what the worker threads are and how to use them, do check this one out. It is a good write up. What do you think about new kid on the block swell three? I did a stream on it and I really like it. Like it's a really cool framework and it has a lot of very nice features. Um, I think there might be like, I really, I think the reactivity and you know, the ways to create dynamic bindings are what uh, makes it stand out basically. So I think if I would have an app that has a lot of computed values and I would want to build it in a really simple way, then I would probably go for swells. I mean, the resulting bundle size is also really impressive, to be honest. So, but yeah, um, if you're curious, do check out my stream with uh, about Swelth. I think we did the RSS reader or something like this. And I talked about my impressions there too. So, okay, continuing, we got uh, using push notifications with service workers and Node.js. A pretty basic introduction to doing push notifications in browsers. Uh, first of all, locally, when you just, you know, register the service worker and then send uh, it locally somehow through the page itself, which is not exactly useful, but yes, you can do that. And then setting up a web server that actually does the web push to the browser, to your service worker through the backend, which is way more useful and exactly what you want to do typically. So if you want to add uh, push notifications to your website, check this one out. Next article we got here, and I think this is the last one for getting started section is hit the ground running with WebAssembly, an introduction to WebAssembly using Mscripton and C, C++, even if you don't know any C, C++. So if you wanted to get into WebAssembly, but were uh, confused as to, you know, how exactly to use it, how do you start with it? What tools do you need to install? How do you write a simple function? And how do you compile it to a WebAssembly module? Well, this article got you covered. You will use Docker, bear in mind, so you won't install majority of the tools locally. You will just use Docker container, which is actually incredibly convenient. So uh, if you are interested in WebAssembly and want to write a simple MD5 hash that runs on WebAssembly and compile it to VASM module using Mscripten, do check this out. It's a pretty good write up that will guide you through everything step by step. I'm using Rust and WebAssembly. It's kind of easy. Yeah, Rust, I think Rust has a way better integration with WebAssembly than Mscripten. Uh, just looking from the, you know, the Mscripten tutorials, it's a bit clunky to set this whole thing up and there is quite a bit of overhead. While Rust has a way easier um, entry point to it, but 
you know, uh, like the downside is that if you know C, C++, you're going to be go, going from Scripton. If you don't, then there is actually a ton of different languages that compile to WebAssembly already. So, but yeah, Rust is definitely a good choice. Okay, continuing. I think we are now done with the getting started and uh, now going to the articles and news section. The first article we got here today is code caching for WebAssembly developers. A pretty cool write up from the V8 team that uh, delves pretty deep into the code caching uh, uh, for WebAssembly and how does it work specifically in V8 uh, with the liftoff and turbofan. If you're writing WebAssembly and you want to know all the nitty gritty of how exactly the engine executes it, then I would highly recommend reading this one, especially considering that it's not that big, but uh, it's, you know, it's always a great write-up. Right, next article we got here is building micro frontends with React, View, and single SPA. Um, single, single page applications sounds a bit weird, but you know what, that's fine. So it's a Nice example of how you can roll a micro front end based architecture with a single SPA framework and using React and Vue to build the sub components of it, getting started from the very scratch and uh, building the final app. Uh, again, this you know might not be something you want to do in majority of cases, but there are some use cases when this will work. And as usual, there's some pretty lengthy discussions as to why the hell do you need that. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next article we got here is from the WebKit team. It's called a new bytecode format for JavaScript core. And uh, yes, we got a new JavaScript bytecode formats that is, seems to be quite much more efficient and um, yeah, quite much more memory efficient above everything. So there's, there's a lot of technical details in here if you're interested, but I just wanna highlight this uh, one part with the comparison charts for memory usage. And just uh, highlight this one sentence. The new bytecode format uses approximately 50% less memory, which means reduction of 10% in overall memory usage for JavaScript heavy websites, such as Facebook and Reddit. Just think about it for a second. 50% less memory just because of the bytecode format switch, which is insane. And uh, yeah, if, <laughs> if you're interested about all the nitty gritty details, do check it out. Uh, now, the. <laughs> The other interesting bit I want to highlight is this section in the background that shows off how exactly the modern JavaScript is executed in one of the modern engines, in this case, JSC. Um, there is four steps to executing JavaScript. There is the low level interpreter, there is baseline JIT, there is DFG JIT, a low latency optimizing compiler, and then there is FTL JIT, a high throughput optimizing compiler. So, it, <laughs> When the next time someone tells you that JavaScript is not compiled, show them this. There is actually three freaking compilers in there. <laughs> and um, like, this is just, like, just think about it. It's supposed to be an interpreted language, right? But we have multiple compilers that work on top of the interpreter to make it a lot faster, which is just crazy. Uh, but yeah, okay, there we go. Um, next thing we got here is a pretty neat write up from the IBM developer blog that is called Node.js memory management in container environments that talks about the best recommendations or best practices of um, using Node.js in container environments like Docker. So if you're Dockerizing your Node.js and want to follow the best practices, here is a really good write up. So make sure to check this one out. Next article we got is Web components, the secret ingredient helping the power of the, let me try that again. Web components, the secret ingredient helping power the web. Uh, so there's been a pretty, pretty flamey and holy worry discussion going on around this week about web components. I think it started with this article that showed, uh, sort of outlined what the web components are, how are they popular? And then, uh, yes, reach hour is paused exactly. I'm, I'm, we're gonna cover that next. I have it, I think the next one is actually it. So the reach hour is shared this one, uh, this article and said, hey, am I looking at this charts correctly? The web components usage actually declined over time. There was a, ch where, where's the chart? Where did it, there was another chart here that he shared that actually showed the decline of web components usage um, over time from the last year. I think this basically covers it, right? So the, the web components usage is falling for some reason. And then um, like there's some additional information in this post, there's some interesting facts and stuff like this. 
but here's the so the out of this rich harris wrote a post called why i don't use web components and in case you didn't know rich harris is the author of svelte for example he's also working on a bunch of other open source tools like rollup and a ton of other really good libraries basically uh, so he's good right and here's a pretty lengthy post that's um, from him that outlines why he doesn't use web components um and a lot of those points are kind of spot on for like you know the stuff like progressive enhancement is incredibly hard with web components not to say that it's impossible but it is really really hard to do and if your javascript is disabled then you're basically screwed at all stuff like css scoping i for example i didn't know that you cannot like if you want to have shadow dom right so the shadow dom is kind of the thing of web components and you want to like it's, it encapsulates the style and everything but if you want to have shadow dom you actually have to put css inside of the style element you cannot use css file because then it will be globally scoped and i was like well, okay that is that is interesting i did not know about that and then there is, yeah, platform fatigue. There's the polyfills that are, I mean, polyfills are amazing, right? So let's just put it this way, but they are still not quite the same as the native support for those features. Composition is another problem. Like there's, yeah, there's, there's a ton of the attributes. Confusion between props and attributes is insane. I did not know this was a thing as well. So if you're working with web components or considering working with web components, be sure to read that blog post, right? So it's like, those are really, really good points. All of them are valid. Now, <laughs> here's the cool part. Um, because the blog post is so well written and very, uh, again, it's, it's a very holy worry topic, right? Um, there is some very heated discussion in the comments. Like, as you can see, the comments are about four times longer than the post itself. <laughs> So make sure to read those as well. There is some very interesting stuff going on around. Now, as a response to this post, someone else wrote a post called why I use web components, my use cases that outlines the use cases where web components are actually good and can be usable and are pretty much valid use cases, right? Which is also totally fair. So again, if you're considering web components, make sure to read all three of those posts because they will give you a pretty good insight into the current state of web components and what should you expect when using them. Which is, yeah, it's, it's a very, very mixed state. Let's just put it this way. All right, uh, this is it for the articles in news. Now we're going to the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness section. First crazy thing of the week we got here is uh, someone decided to enable Node.js and Python interoperability, uh, which is, yeah, it's like, yeah, I mean, why not? So the idea is that both languages are written in C++. So um, yeah, he just did the interop between Node.js and Python using C++, which may, makes it even more crazy. If that sounds interesting, there is source code uh, on GitHub and there's a small write-up on how exactly he did that. So if you are interested, do check it out. It's a bit crazy. And I really like how it starts. It's like Node.js and Python interoperability is relatively easy, striked out, doable. <laughs> I guess he started writing it when it was easy and then he tried doing it. And it turns out it's not that easy, but uh, yeah, that's a thing you could do actually. So do check it out. It's a pretty interesting experiment. All right, next article we got here is micro frontends, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is a relatively short write-up on the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, micro frontends and what exactly you should uh, keep in mind when developing them. So if you're looking into micro frontends and if you're thinking about them, do check this one out. Absolutely, there are some very good points in here that you have to keep in mind when basically developing uh, micro frontends. I also absolutely love this meme, um, 50 megabytes of JavaScript. Is this micro frontends? That's like, <laughs> you have 50 megabytes of JavaScript, you have different problems than micro frontends, I think, but uh, there we go. All right, next thing we got here is uh, widening the web with ECMA 402, our work on internationalization extension of JavaScript. Uh, so this is a pretty nice write-up on what is happening with the info extensions for JavaScript. As, and what is ECMA 402, why does it needs to be, what is the cycle of editing, how do they work, and basically all you had to know about Intel in JavaScript and also a really nice table of feature support in different browsers. 
Now, here's the interesting things. The original feature set is not 100% supported in, well, in any browser really, which, which was a bit surprising to me. But uh, yeah, if you're working with Intel and JavaScript and were curious about the state of art and uh, the ECMA committee work, then do check this one out. There's some pretty interesting info here. Next thing we got here is this insane challenge. So uh, the link was shared by Matthias Binance. Uh, the tweet goes, got a few hours to spare. I challenge you to view the actual source code for Sammy Kamkar's web page, semi.pl. And um, here's the web page. It looks very simple, right? But uh, I also challenge you to just go ahead and um, actually try to view source code. So if you right click, you will find there's like a ton of Easter eggs um, that basically prevent you from seeing the actual code here. And uh, there is insane amount of different hacks used um, that basically force you to figure out other creative ways to find the source code. And no, you will not actually see the source code in here as well. And no, you will not see it in console. No, you will not see it in requests. And uh, I actually managed to do it relatively quickly, but I used a dirty trick basically to do that. So just, you know, if you have a few hours to spare, or I guess a few minutes, depending on your level, just have a look at the website and try to find the source code. It is actually quite entertaining. All right, uh, next thing we got here is the, again, tweet from uh, Matthias Binance. It says, object from entries is now available in Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Node.js, and it's a very convenient way of converting object.entries back to the object. Uh, there's also a nice blog write-up that uh, outlines how exactly it works and uh, shows the supported browsers and uh, Node.js versions. Oh, next thing, this is probably one of my favorite small things we got this week around, is a blog post from Windows, from Microsoft guys that uh, is titled Building Hybrid Applications with WebView 2 Developer Preview. Now it might sound a bit cryptic, but here's what's happening. So the Microsoft is building the new Chromium-based Edge, right? Which is actually an amazing browser and been updating at quite a fast pace and I cannot wait for the stable release, to be honest. Uh, I think I'm just gonna be switching from Chrome to um, Edge because it just works a lot faster than Chrome. But that's not the interesting part. So they are gonna be using Chromium-based Edge as a part of Windows to render all the web view content inside of the Windows, which means that any apps that you're gonna use that use web views, be it C++, uh, Windows 32 apps, be it UVP, be it VPF, be it WinForms, all are gonna have web views that are Chrome, basically Chromium-based, right? This also goes, if you didn't hear, uh, if you never heard about that, the Microsoft's in there, uh, actually, if we go to the Windows Store, come on, come on, what's happening? Where's my Windows Store? There we go. So if you go in the Windows Store, at one point, Microsoft actually started indexing progressive web apps and putting them into the Windows Store. That means that once you go into the Windows Store and install the app from Windows Store as a progressive web app, it actually will run in Chromium WebView, which is amazing. Just imagine the possibilities. So essentially it's gonna be like, kind of like um, Electron running inside of Windows. I wonder if at one point they will just include Node.js and say, hey, we actually have the full Electron mode working in Windows without overhead, because this is gonna be freaking amazing. Uh, Node.js and Chakra Core was a waste of time now. I mean, it wasn't a waste of time. It did push the Node.js to uh, implement the, what do you call them? The Basically the flexible API for swapping the engines, right? So I wouldn't call that a waste of time. It's still quite productive. But yeah, the whole, like it feels a bit, a bit sad for the teams who worked on the old Edge and, and Chakra Core because there was a lot of really cool work done. Like the Chakra Core is the only engine that has time travel, for example, now for de debugging time travel. I don't think anyone else implemented it yet, but it is in Chakra Core and you can actually use it, which is like, I just hope they will bring it. Maybe, maybe the Edge team now will bring uh, that to Chromium. That would be kind of amazing. But uh, there we go. So uh, WebView 2 is going to be Chromium based in Windows. And this is kind of amazing. And I cannot wait to see what else Microsoft does because for some reason in 2019, I'm excited to see what Microsoft will release. <laughs> I cannot really believe myself, but there we go. All right, uh, continuing, we got the uh, new 
RFC proposal from the uh, Next.js guys for dynamic routes. It's finally here. We finally are getting dynamic routes in Next.js without any servers or anything like that. It's gonna be, um, it's gonna be um, as usual file-based and currently they're proposing using dollar symbol to denote the dynamically constructed routes which looks quite good. So you're gonna be able to make dynamic routes in Next.js without having any custom server. This looks absolutely amazing. So if you are using Next.js and you wanted this, make sure to read through the proposal and give them your comments. Uh, hey, Budget Gamer, welcome to the stream. A good day to you as well. Microsoft and Google swap places, absolutely. Like Google and Apple both have been doing some weird stuff lately. Microsoft has been just killing it lately with all of this, including GitHub. I mean, come on, it's not Microsoft, basically. I keep forgetting that it is Microsoft, but it is. All right, continuing, we got a um, new PR that's been merged into the React master, at least for now. Uh, that is uh, part of the Flare uh, event rework. And this PR adds the use event hook uh, that is basically able to determine, no, oh, sorry, not determine, to define the umbrella um, catchers for the events within the nested components. So the way it works is you can use the event hook on press thing, right? And then you pass it a handler and then you use this hook within the press somewhere in your component and everything that is nested within this press will be caught by that hook, which is I guess could be useful in quite a lot of places. Like I still think it's a very niche thing, but the way to do this could be quite helpful for stuff like pop-ups, you know, closing pop-ups and things like this. It's anyway, seems interesting. So again, for now it's just in stable API and release and React Flare flag and everything. But uh, it's quite interesting to see the Flare work continuing essentially. Okay. Um, next thing we got here is the Google Earth team announces that they're going to be using WebAssembly instead of relying on Chrome specific features to bring uh, Google Earth to more browsers, which is uh, kind of nice to see, to be honest. <laughs> Google Earth, I think, is notorious for not working anywhere but in Google Chrome because they use some very specific Google Chrome features that were not available anywhere else. But now they can do the same with just using WebAssembly and... Uh, once WebAssembly gets a SIM support and dynamic linking, it's gonna be basically better for all the browsers. So it's really cool to see Google Earth moving to be more ubiquitous, I guess. Next thing we got here is Google Search finally gets service workers. It's a pretty neat write-up on um, how Google added service workers to Google Search. What were the problems? There's actually a ton of problems related to adding it to Google search. You would think it's simple as that, right? But it's actually not that simple. And uh, what kind of solutions, what kind of mitigations did they use to cover those problems and issues? It's a really cool write-up. So if you're using service workers or planning to use them, make sure to read that. There's some really cool info here. Uh, YouTube editor and Hangouts, broken in Firefox and Safari. Oh yeah, those two are, yeah. They're, they're, I mean, I'm hoping they will also switch to, um, um, God damn it. They also switched to web uh, assembly at one point and become engine independent essentially. I mean, this is why we need web assembly, right? So uh, it's quite exciting to see Google finally taking some steps to make their stuff work and not just Chrome. But uh, there we go. All right, so the next thing we got here is the um, uh, very sad notes to be honest. It's a uh, post or gist gist on GitHub from one of the developers working in, at NPM titled when will npm 691 be released and other prs merged uh, the name of the um, file here is npm strike md so it seems like after the npm fired several members of the open source community which was you know pretty big and there was like a lot of articles about that a bunch of core employees just in solidarity put their work on hold so they are basically on strike effectively and there is like a lot of discussions going on there and they're basically fighting NPM to make things right, which is like, on one hand, it's really sad to see that stuff like this happens. On the other hand, it's really cool to see that they are basically fighting them for, you know, the employees' rights essentially here, right? 
So yeah, if you're interested in the state of NPM, make sure to read that. There's also a bunch of comments and discussions going on. Um, yeah, it's it's a very weird situation, and I'm just I'm hoping NPM will just you know put their head out of their ass and make it right for the employees because this is just it's not does not look good for the company itself. And it's, I I wonder how they will hire anyone who's any good basically after that and knows about the history of NPM because you know. I personally wouldn't work in a place like this if they want to fix the problems they caused essentially. But there we go. Okay, next thing we got here is the Microsoft Edge, the Chromium based one. Preview builds are now available for Windows 7, 8 and 8.1. So if you're still living on older versions of Windows, you can now finally try the newer uh, Microsoft Edge browser, which is kind of neat. And I would actually recommend trying it because it's quite good. <clears throat> and the last thing we got here is the Atom nightly releases. So the Atom will now have the nightly branch that is uh, going to be forked directly from master and released every 24 hours. And uh, yes, as the caveats say, it's probably going to be quite broken. <laughs> so, but if you want to do it anyway, feel free to try it out. That sounds uh, pretty cool. All right, that is it for the uh, bit-sized awesomeness bit that sounds terrible but uh, there we go we get to the releases section now and the first release of the week is v8 version 7.6 that brings uh, performance improvements to json.pars which is actually quite mind-blowing um, so they are in some cases they are almost double the speed of json pars and um, yeah it's it, and it's also more memory efficient now <laughs> And another point here is frozen sealed arrays improvements, which is also kind of mind blowing. The um, sometimes being increased in speed up to like 15 times, 10 times. I don't know how the team manages to do that, but every time I see those release notes, it just blows my mind. There is uh, also promise dot all settled added and improved begin supports, uh, which is quite nice. You can now do two local string, uh, two local string uh, formatting of begins that are, uh, yeah, nicely formatted now, even if they are super long and super big, which is uh, super nice. And we also got Intel date time format improvements and uh, native stack walking, which is quite convenient. So this should land in the next release of Chrome. And I'm not actually sure how is Node.js looking this days with uh, V8 updates, but uh, we're gonna see. I'm, I'm thinking this is probably gonna land in uh, 12 something basically. Okay, continuing, we got Buffett, uh, Buffet JS. I, I'm not sure, how do you read that in English actually? Is it Buffet? I imagine this is gonna be a Buffet, right? Because it's a French word. Yeah, Buffet, okay. So I got Buffet JS version 1.0. It's a component library from Strapi guys. It's, uh, they have a storybook. It actually looks quite nice. So they have a bunch of components that look pretty slick. So the date picker looks quite nicely and uh, say yeah, like select tables and text areas and everything. So if you are looking for a component library, do check this one out. And next thing we got here is Toast UI Grid 4.0. Uh, the final release here with a bunch of features. The grid itself look actually quite nice. So if you were looking for a complex grid solution for um, JavaScript, then do check this one out. Maybe this is what you wanted. And next release we got here is uBlock Origin version 1.20. Now, this is not a major release and there's basically mostly just the fixes and minor changes, but I will never get tired of recommending uBlock Origin to about everyone and anyone because it is amazing and it is uh, the best ad blocker of there that doesn't need all your memory. So if you're not using it, do check it out. Chrome is going to block, no, Chrome is not going to block uBlock origin. They're not going to block ad blockers. They are changing the manifest thing and they already backtracked halfway on it. Uh, I, I don't like, I'm not sure if they're gonna go through the changes or not. They're still, you know, it's still open for discussion. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, if they're gonna do it, uh, the forks of the Chromium are not gonna do it. And then people are just gonna switch from uh, Chrome to, Chromium forks, right? I'm not, I don't think the Google is gonna go through with it because it doesn't make sense. Like we'll see how that ends up, but um, they're not gonna block it completely. They're just gonna limit the number, at least in the current state, they're limiting the number of rules 
you can have 250,000 uh, network filters. So in my case, I have 220,000 uh, 220, network filters active and then cosmetic filters doesn't matter. So in this case, the Chromium, Chrome team says that the manifest with three will only allow 150,000 network filters, which again, still lower than what I want, which means I would just switch to something that supports the number I want. But I don't think they're gonna go through with that. If they do, this might as well start the demise of the Chrome browser, which would be a bit sad, but uh, we'll see how that develops. Okay, the next release we got here is Prisma 2 Preview, type safe database access and declarative migrations. A uh, new nice preview of Prisma 2 toolset for working with uh, databases. So they are introducing two major tools, uh, Photon and Lyft. Photon is a type safe and auto generated databases client, uh, think ORM, and Lyft is a declarative data modeling and database migrations tool. They are can be used as a standalone tools or together in app if you want to. And yeah, as usual, Prisma 2, if you've never heard about it, is a GraphQL tool set. So if you're working with GraphQL or was looking into GraphQL, do check this one out. It actually looks really neat. So it basically sets up everything for you. I was using Prisma 1 and this is totally different now. Yes, it is different, but it's a good thing, right? It seems to be like 20 times more convenient because Prisma 1 was a bit of a pain in ass to set up, to be honest. Prisma 2 seems to be doing everything for you, which is, I'm totally fine with that. Like, yes, it's gonna take some time migrating, but man, this looks great. So I don't know what you're complaining about. <laughs> okay, continue. All right, I think that was, yeah, that was it for the releases. Now we've got libraries and demos. And the first uh, library we got here today is J, supercharged JavaScript REPL for your command line that has a bunch of uh, cool features like auto installing your dependencies, like uh, previewing the results, like uh, auto complete of the uh, uh, modules, uh, like, yeah, basically everything you could imagine is here. Looks quite neat. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is globster.xyz, a really nice website to test your globs, which could be incredibly useful when you're working with the file stream, uh, the, with the file matching, right? So you can actually just change, um, da -da -da. wait a second, how do I write things? Yes, there we go. So, and you can actually see, so you can actually write this tree as well. Uh, and then see how your glob changes it, which is super convenient. Uh, so yes, if you're working with globs, make sure to check this one out. Next thing we got here is fuzzy JS, a fuzzy search algorithm in JavaScript that allows you to do stuff like this, you know, like sets index search matches SSJS. So something very similar to uh, VS Code's um, commands pattern or sublime text command pattern or you know any other that uses fuzzy matching essentially also supports scores and ranges if you are interested seems to be pretty full feature to be honest so if, if that sounds interesting do check it out next thing we got here is spotlight web's most easy to integrate light box gallery library super lightweight outstanding performance and no dependencies it, it does indeed look very nice and uh Seems to be quite cool. So if you are looking for a um, light box that is standalone and doesn't require dependencies, then do check this one out. Next thing we got here is lightweight charts, financial lightweight charts built with HTML5 canvas. Uh, they do look pretty nice. Um, so yeah, I guess if you work in finances, this is something you might want to look at. Uh, so they do also have the more proprietary like paid versions that have a bit more features, but the open source one is Apache 2 licensed, uh, which is still quite nice. So do check them out. Next thing we got here is React Helmet, a document head manager for React. So if you ever needed to change the head from the React components and you didn't want to do it uh, manually, then this thing basically got the solution for you. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. Next thing we got here is file robot image editor, a um, nice component set of components for editing images uh, in browser. So you can like they have the nice demo, you can pick the image and then you can uh, click edit and upload. And uh, in addition to basic features like uh, cropping and resizing, 
and uh, orientation changes. They also have a bunch of effects and filters that you can apply pretty much like an Instagram. Now, the um, interesting thing for uh, those of you guys who are interested in challenges, they seem to be doing those processes like the filters in the main thread. So if you're interested, uh, you could send them a pull request that moves this logic into the web worker because then it would make it a lot more responsive. Nonetheless, it's a pretty nice um, open source image editor. So if you're interested, do check it out. Next thing we got here is JXL version three, the JavaScript spreadsheets, uh, basically plain JavaScript spreadsheet like uh, thing that allows you to manipulate rows and tables. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. The next thing we got here is freeze frame JS, a library that pauses animated GIFs and enables them to, <clears throat> apologies, to animate on mouse hover, mouse click, touch event or with trigger release functions. Very straightforward, works quite nicely. So you know you can actually pause and uh, animate GIFs on different events, which might be quite useful in some cases. You also have custom triggers and stuff like this. Um, yeah, I, I, that basically all it does. I don't know what to say. That sounds interesting, do check it out. The next thing we got here is mimic fn, make a function mimic another one. So this is a very specific use case. One of the cases when you want to wrap a function, but you still want to provide all the properties that function had in an original case, right? So if you just use a function to wrap it, you obviously won't have the properties of original function. And what mimicfn does, it actually proxies those properties to your mimic function. Um, so if that sounds useful, do check it out. I honestly cannot see that many use cases. I don't think I've ever had actually a need to do something like this, but uh, maybe you do, so do check it out. Next thing we got here is Xt House. Analyze the impact of a browser extension. Uh, let me try. Let me try that again. Analyze the impact of a browser extension on web performance. Uh, so this one is Chrome specific. Uh, it uses Lighthouse to basically launch a browser with and without your extension and compare the performance of the specific. Uh, extension automatically, right? And show you the nice chart. So it like compares the impacts of uBlock Origin, Tamper Monkey, Pinterest, Save Button, Google Translate, and so on and so forth. There's like a bunch of them here. And uh, yes, Skype is actually surprisingly freaking heavy on your browser. What the hell is going on there? But uh, yes, there you go. So if you were curious as to how the extensions you use impact the browser or specifically Chrome in this case, I guess, you can uh, try it out with this command line tool. Next thing we got here is React Toastify. React notifications made easy. Some pretty neat Toast notifications for React that you can uh, quite easily customize, show, and then clear all. Uh, seems to be quite nice API. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is React Mosaic, a tiling window manager for React that allows you to drag your windows like tiles. Uh, that actually looks pretty damn good. Uh, and then there's like auto range buttons, add more windows and stuff like this. So if you needed something like this in your React project, do check it out. This seems to be actually very, very cool. And it also has like themes and stuff. Right, so next thing we got here is React Move, beautiful data-driven animations for React. Yet another um, animation library for React that uh, actually seems to be very slick. So. Uh, yeah, if you were looking for moving animating library for React, then do check this one out. Next thing we got here is just a task library that just works. A task runner from a Microsoft team. So if you are looking for yet another task runner for some reason, if you are still using them and you have a very complex build steps, I guess, do check this one out. Maybe this is what you were looking for. The next thing we got here is JBox, a jQuery plugin that makes it easy to create customizable tooltips, model windows, image galleries, and more. If you're still using jQuery's and you wanted a very fancy uh, box that it can be a model or hover or notice or um, avatar or I don't know, login form or whatever the hell you imagine, do check this one out. It actually seems to be quite good. <laughs> I haven't used jQuery in ages to be honest, but uh, this one looks quite nice. All right, next thing we got here is Delonator. Um, so I, I, I guess Delonator, maybe this is how you read this. 
Uh, but this is basically a JavaScript implementation of uh, Delaney triangulation of 2D points. Uh, if you don't know what this is, you probably never needed it. If you do, then, well, there you go. You can now do it in JavaScript. It actually seems to be quite performant. There is uh, also some benchmarks over here if you're curious. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. The next thing we got here is OpenCV for Node.js. Uh, Node.js bindings to OpenCV 3 and 4. So if you ever wanted to work with images in JavaScript, then uh, there you go. You can now just use OpenCV. Has a bunch of examples and tutorials included. So this is actually quite nice. Next thing we got here is Funk, a simple way to build command line tools. The authors say it's also more popular way, but I'm not sure more popular than what, but uh, there we go. So it's a simple way to build command line tools uh, that is also a very object oriented way that allows you to use basically decorators and objects to create your commands. And it looks fine, but as you might know, I'm not a huge fan of object oriented programming. So for me, that does not look that compelling, but maybe it does for you. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is node bit.ly, a bits.ly library for node.js. Uh, currently looking for a new maintainer actually. So uh, it's an official bit.ly API. And uh, if you're using bit.ly and if you wanted an API project, do check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you're looking for. And maybe you wanna take it uh, over and maintain it. Next thing we got here is Hexo, a fast, simple and powerful block framework. Um, yeah, it's just, just a block framework, I guess. Not much to say here. So if you're looking for a block framework, do check this one out. It seems to be all included. Maybe this is what you were looking for based on markdown as usual, like as all of those are nowadays. Um, next thing we got here is Frontity. This one is pretty interesting. So it allows you to use React.js as a front end for WebPress, uh, for WebPress, no, for WordPress. So you can actually use React.js uh, themes and front ends for the WordPress as I guess using WordPress as backend. And uh, yeah, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It is now version 1.0, which is quite nice. So it's stable and uh, I guess ready to use. Next thing we got here is not exactly JavaScript, but I just found that this repo is really nice. Uh, the documentation compendium. It's a set of various readme templates and tips on writing high quality docs that people want to read. <clears throat> I'm sorry, guys. Um, so basically they have a set of markdown files that um, describe everything you might want to document in your project and exactly the best practices on how to do this. Things to remember, things you should avoid and stuff like this. So if you're maintaining or making an open source project, make sure to check out uh, this one. There is a lot of very handy uh, tips here. All right, the last repo we got here is a new repo from TC39 committee that is called how we work that documents how TC39 operates and how can you personally participate in their work, which is really, really cool. So if you ever wondered how the uh, ECMAScript standard gets made, do check this one out. Okay, um, that is it for the libraries and demos. Before we wrap up, I have uh, two things that I want to highlight. The first one is AppScope uh, with appsco.pe domain that uh, features the progressive web apps that you can install to your desktop or install to your mobile that work really well. Like Twitter Lite, for example, is probably one of my uh, favorite apps on mobile phone. I almost completely switched to using the progressive web app because I just don't see what's the difference between the native and progressive there. They also have the Dino game, Google Maps, and so on and so forth. There's like a huge catalog here. So if you're interested in progressive web apps, do check it out. There is actually a ton of them here. And the last thing I want to show is this comparison of um, Angular, Vue, Ember, and React.js command lines, where Angular, Vue, and Ember be like, I protect you until you're ready. I'll keep you warm. And React Cli is like, fly, bitch which is actually pretty close to the reality in my opinion. So um, there you go. All right, this is it from my side. Uh, this was BX Chess Weekly episode 68. If you guys have any questions, suggestions, or there are links that you think I might have missed today, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. Uh, if not, then uh, I guess thank you very much for watching. As usual, you can find all the links mentioned on the GitHub page or on bxjs.dev website. 
uh, once it updates in a few uh, hours, I guess. And uh, yes, as usual, we have a very nice Discord server that you can join if you have any JavaScript related questions. Um, if, if you need any help as well, we are more than happy to help. I'm usually there majority of the time. And uh, yeah, I guess there's no questions, no suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you missed uh, some parts of it or all of it, so if you just joined, um, as usually there's gonna be a VOD available on Twitch immediately after the stream. And there's going to be um, a version on YouTube after I re-upload it there after a couple of hours. So that's it from my side. Thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.